Good morning, everybody, and to everybody online. Good morning to you guys, or good afternoon, or good evening. I'm Michael Kopsack. I run uh, experience design and research for networking here at Cisco. So I'm super excited to be here today. I've been at the company for about 13 months. And a couple of caveats before I get going. I understand this is a super technical group, OK? I'm not a super technical guy. Uh, so right off the bat, I lead design. Right? So my job is to work with our engineering colleagues, our product management colleagues, and shape the user experiences that we're going to provide our customers. So if you have super detailed uh, technical questions, you can throw them out there. I can't guarantee that I'm going to have an answer for you. But uh, I, we have a volunteer who's going to capture those questions in relation to these concepts. And uh, if they pass them along to me, I'll work with my engineering colleagues and PM colleagues and get back to you. OK? Uh, all right. With that caveat, I'm going to get going. So here's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, I'm going to give, I'm going to basically shape the uh, the problem space. What I'm really uh, going to talk about, and then uh, I'm going to talk about some design principles that's driving our thinking. I'm sorry, I'm blocking your way. Uh, is that a better place for me to stand? Okay. Um, and then um, I'm actually going to go into some details about how we're thinking about things, and then uh, we can do a screen level walkthrough. Okay. So that's the the game plan. So here's the problem space. From a user experience perspective, you know, historically, as this audience well knows, uh, it's all been about network management, right? Uh, that really started with command line, been command line for a long time. We've introduced other tools in the marketplace with Prime, EpicEM, where we're starting to introduce user experience as a part of that paradigm. But now, we're trying to move into a completely different direction, right? Graduate, if you will, from network management to intent and outcomes. So, Organizations can express an intent and aim for outcomes through the network. Networks, as we all know, are critical to the lifeblood of most organizations. So it's a different game. And, and feel free to stop me. You look like you have a question or no? Nope. nope. Oh, you do? OK, all right. So in, in, in the design world, we try and get alignment internally and externally on what really matters. So we, we articulate a set of principles. So we get everybody on the same page about, hey, here's where we're going. It's not about pixels. It's not about buttons. It's not about colors. It's about, in principle, where do we want to go? So we articulate those design principles. I'm here to share those with you today. If you have feedback on those and you think they're the right ones or you don't, hey, good to hear. Love to hear. The first is we know that we have to do a lot to build confidence and win trust. I've been uh, spending a lot of time with the senior leaders of the company working on product quality initiatives. We know that customers, uh, there's this lagging period between when we release products and the, that adoption, right? Because everybody wants to kind of step back and make sure that somebody else tests it, somebody else tries it, wins confidence. Okay, now I'm ready to test it in my lab. Now I'm ready to roll it out into my network. So we need to get into a faster cadence where our innovations can make it into your networks quicker. So how do we do that? And that's by making solutions that do exactly this. They build confidence and win trust. So if I'm going to introduce a, a change in my network, what's the confidence level I have that things aren't going to break, things aren't going to go on fire, I'm not going to lose my job, you know, quality of service for customers and internal people isn't going to suffer, right? So our goal in doing what I'm going to show you today is primarily focused on this, building confidence and winning trust through the user experience. The next is, one Cisco, I'm heard. So if you're using a tool like Prime or EpicAM today, you've got a deep investment on those tools, right? You spend a lot of tool time. There's a lot of data in those tools. There's a lot that we already know about your network. So as we introduce these other tools, we don't want you to reinvent wheels in the sense that let's take some of that data and some of that infrastructure and learn it, understand it, and help you move forward with it versus starting from ground zero. Next one is a little bit more complicated, persuasive design. So I talked about confidence, right? So if you're going to win, you're going to, if we just met, right? You don't know me. How do I trust you, right? So trust is earned, right? And what we're trying to do is we're trying to create what we call persuasive design to allow the users of our tools to feel empowered, meaning we're going to win you over. We're going to give you ways to test, ways to simulate, ways to learn. Ways to build that confidence so that as you execute those changes in the network, that you know, things aren't going to go on fire and there's not going to be major problems. 
Next one is natural progression. So today, if you think about the anatomy of a command line script or a sequence of things you're going to do on devices, it's like very linear. It's like, we're going to do this, we're going to do this, we're going to do this. You can read the scripts and see, oh, this is going to happen. This, this knob is turned, this switch is dialed, that sort of thing, right? What we're trying to make from a user experience perspective, and actually this is kind of new for us, um, is we're trying to make it feel more natural. Like, I understand where I'm starting. Uh, understanding where I'm going, and I understand overall what I have to do. For, let me let me make it a little more uh, like you. Here's an offline analogy. You want to make a deposit at the bank, right? Well, you first you got to walk in the bank. You got to fill out your slip. You got to go up to the teller. You got to give the teller the whatever the checks or cash you're going to do. There's an interaction. The person gives you back you know a receipt, right? You have an expectation. You understand that natural progression of. Money goes from here to here, right? So in the networking world, specific to these pretty sophisticated changes in networks, we want it to feel natural. We want it to feel intuitive. We want it to feel like, OK, hey, organization, here's what I've got to do. I know where I start. I know the steps I have to go through so I can plan. Then I can execute. Is all that making sense, right? So if anybody asks me, from anybody else in the rest of the organization, from an audit or compliance or IT leadership perspective, where are you on this thing? I can say with confidence, this is what's happened, and this is what's going to happen. So our tools are going to be specifically focused on that. We know our audience. We know that there's, uh, you know, it's primarily uh, you know, folks who uh, may, may enjoy games, right? So what can we do to gamify the experience? Now, the, the specific concepts I'm going to show today don't pivot too heavily on this. Uh, so uh, keep that in mind as we move into the screen level uh, demo here. But is he here? Yes. I, I know you're doing an introduction, but what do you mean by gamify? I'm not really privy to game stuff. I know one video game, and that's it. I know. Who, who's a gamer here? I like Pac-Man. <laughs> I, I play Kerbal Space Program, and here? that's it. And nothing else. So I don't know what the term means, really. I also like Donkey Kong. So in, in, in the design world and in the gaming world, there's this concept of achievement, right? And, and, and status and ranking. Those are things that really matter to gamers, right? So how am I doing in relation to my peers, right? What's my status? How, what have I achieved? Hmm. So we're trying to take those concepts into the network management paradigms. So as what? you collaborate... I I, I, so far, what I've seen of all that is just insulting. I feel personally insulted every time I've seen that. As a professional, yeah, like you're, what you're actually, the way I, I perceive my career is I'm like a lawyer or a doctor. I'm not playing games. I'm deadly serious. Oh, absolutely. Right? I'm spending yeah. tens of millions of dollars of somebody's money. Oh, yes. I do not want to be gamified. Well, That's just insulting. Everything I've seen about gamification might be fine in a computer game for funsies where it yep. doesn't matter. Right. But for serious stuff, no, it's insulting. Personally insulting, <clears throat> as well as trivial in a professional environment. I, I hear you loud and clear. Mm. So let me, be, let me be clear. Mm. So it's not a game. You're absolutely right. What I'm talking about is you as an individual accomplishing things and us giving you acknowledgement that you've accomplished those things. So it's not like I'm playing a game with the network. Let me be clear. Mm. So thank you for bringing that up. Uh, it's more about those specific comp those specific concepts around accomplishment that we're pivoting towards. It's not, and, and when I show you the UI, you'll see there's no game there, okay. right? But it's so. Thank you very much for bringing that up. So it's not intending to to go in the uh, oh this just, is fun, but it's, it's one more of the on things those that irks me a great deal is you know this isn't a game. Yeah. You know what we do is deadly serious. We have some of us work nuclear or medical or oh yeah. You know, or in businesses that actually have real money. Yep. You know, with real consequences, unlike what happens to networking vendors. And I have a real problem with it. Yep. Okay. You get, so I'm interested to see. you get a little badge saying, you, know, you have stopped five nuclear meltdowns. Uh, something like that, yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Great point. So we'll, we'll keep that in mind. I, yeah, but I but is, is this addressing the Cisco learning area or... Where do you see gamified uh, it, achievement? It, yes. So we can tie your understanding of our products, right, and your accomplishment with our you know, certifications, those kind of things, to this concept. So it's, let me again be clear, this isn't about making a video game UI. Like you'll see the UIs, right? There's no gaming there. It's more about what can we learn from those paradigms that have been pretty successful, <clears throat> right? Building communities of practice, accomplishment, 
recognition among peers. Those are the concepts that we're, we're pivoting on. Will you give some examples of that later? Like I said, that this particular concept, this no. Uh, but uh, keep in mind that what I'm going to show you is around, it, it, it's around software image management. And uh, there's, we haven't really baked this concept in, but when we do, it will be around accomplishment. Um, yeah, I, 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 the reason I asked about examples is I'm struggling. I'm struggling to see what accomplishment I need to you know, have, on my, have, have on my profile as, you know, has managed 1,000 <coughs> devices. Uh, yeah, ching. I, I, and, I'm, and maybe I'm misunderstanding what you mean, but that when, I, when we talk about gamification, mm -hmm. normally that's what it is. It's like you, you get, ooh, an achievement. Ding, a little star comes up or a trophy um, because you did something. And I'm trying to figure out in the context of my job, what on earth would be considered an accomplishment? And maybe that's the gap. Maybe that's my gap rather than yours, but. Well, let me I'm address trying. that. So this is coming from a lot of customer research, okay? I'll tell you about an anecdote in user research. So we were talking with a, a customer and doing some field research, and, and he gave us a, a story of, uh, we were talking in the context of a break fix scenario, right? There was a problem with the network he needed to solve, right? There was, to your comment earlier, there was direct consequences of that break, right? There was operational inefficiency, operational problem. Mm -hmm. So in the context of understanding that problem space with that particular you know, customer, he made the comment of, you know, by the time he got through, he was the hero, right? Because he solved that problem, right? So by solving that problem in this short period of time, mm -hmm. he felt like he was accomplished. He's like, look. From the moment I heard about that to the moment that that was resolved, mm -hmm. like people were surprised by that. People were thankful that happened, right? Because in this case, this was a medical scenario. So there was, to your comment, there was real human lives at stake, right? So he felt like a hero. He went home that day and he told his son, he said, look, you know, daddy was a hero at work today because I solved the problem in record time. Now that's not relation to the tools we offer. I'm, I'm just giving you a scenario of, that what we're trying to go towards is enabling people to feel like I can quickly understand what a problem is and I can solve that problem. Well, or, and and yeah. can I just say, I don't, I don't want people to feel like they can solve the problem. Mm -hmm. I want them to actually be able to solve the problem. Yep. And I think that might be the disconnect that we're seeing with, with some of us more technical folks is like, we want to be enabled, and, and for me and for most of us, I think a lot of the, the charge we get out of this job is internal. Like there's not, you know, the, the, there's, it's, it's an intrinsic, like we know we figured it out. And that, for, for me anyway, and everybody else can speak, is enough. But it's, but it's how do we really make them capable as opposed to making people feel like they've accomplished something and that's a there's a dramatic difference I understand. in those two things yep so um, I think I think generally we're going in that direction where to feel accomplished you actually have to accomplish so to your point it's not we're not trying to create a sense that I feel like I can do something but <coughs> excuse me <clears throat> that I did do something and that's an accomplishment right I, I guess I guess I'm worried that if I accomplish something, I solve a problem, I expect my boss to pat me on the head and go, good boy, thank you. I remember that when it comes to pay rise time, rather than like my, my kids at preschool who get to take the little guard sign home that says I'm star student for the week, right? It, it, it's, I don't, I'm, I'm wondering who it's for. Right? See, is it for me or is it for my boss to look and see, hey, who got the most, mm -hmm. the most trophies of the system? So anyway, we, we're probably... Let's see the demo and then yeah, pick it apart after we've seen a practical off, example. Right, Maybe yeah, there's so, some... So. Well, it looks like i got to dig deeper here. If you're having fun now, yeah. you wait for the demo. <laughs> <laughs> I, know, I know we want to move on, and Greg sort of tri you know, ushered that in that direction, but I, this is just my opinion. I'm no expert in marketing, so I think there's just a little bit of a conflict between a message you know, and, and then, again, the technology we haven't gotten to yet, so it might change dramatically, we hope. Yeah. But from, a, from that standpoint, from a messaging standpoint, uh, you know, I, I just was thinking about the concept of the network hero and how we need to move away from that idea. Um, so that's, again, that's me. I'm not an expert in marketing, how you message a, a, a philosophy of networking out. Um, and obviously Cisco knows what they're doing. But um, 
yeah, the concept of a network hero doesn't sit well with me because you're trying to enable teams to work together to have a collaborative sharing of information when you draw that information out of the network and so somebody else can pick up a ticket, yep. somebody else can uh, resolve a problem and, and help or, or whatever. Yep. Um, and so you're, you're kind of creating a team of a bunch of network heroes. You know what I mean? And so you sort of don't have a hero per se. I don't know. So again, yeah, again semantics yeah. maybe, or just messaging. You know, I don't, I'm not it's, ragging on the technology. It's a marketing message, right? Exactly, I mean, and, that's, and that's why I started with that. Yeah. So but, let me, but again, I just wanted to. I'm not a marketing guy. I'm not here to market <laughs> well, to you guys. Right? What, what I'm so, saying is okay. I want to see the tech. Okay, yeah. so, fair enough. Yeah. Yeah. And things yeah. could change very, very significantly. Yep. That was fun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> This is speaks for what? But that's why I'm here, right? So bring it up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right, so what we're trying to do is create a repeatable model, right, that users can understand. Because consistency and, and understanding is the, uh, you know, basically um, usability, right? So our job is to create products that are easy to understand, easy to use, and easy to execute on. So how do we do that? The first step is we allow the organization, the team, the user, right, Fair. to express that intent, right? What is it that they want to do and achieve? What are the outcomes that they're looking for? The next is, how do they understand whether or not they're ready for that kind of change, right? So this is around the confidence building. Remember I talked about winning trust uh, by building confidence? This is that first step in that journey. So assessment of readiness. The next is planning. So using our tools to plan that kind of change, right? So starting from, okay, I said this is what I want to do. Here's my understanding of readiness. Now I'm in the planning, right? So what we want to do is create this common framework across all the intents so that an organization or a team can know the steps they got to go through. The next one is simulation. So can I do a series of pre-checks to understand what that change might mean. More futuristic, can I actually simulate the topology of the network to introduce these changes? That kind of thing. The next is actually executing the change. Like this is where the meat and potatoes are, right? This is introducing the change into the network. And this is measurement, right? This is so we can understand and you can understand what you set out to do, executing on the change, measuring those changes. Maybe some things worked, maybe some things didn't work. Maybe the things weren't optimized in some way. So how do we review and go back to the plan, make some tweaks, right? Maybe there's some unexpected outcomes in a positive way. Maybe there was some unexpected outcomes in a, in, in a not positive way. Simulation again, right? So pre-check again. OK, we're going to make another change. Let's simulate that. And then the execution against the optimization. Right? So what we want to do is create a consistent framework around the interactions of a team with our tools or individuals with our tools so that um, they can understand, oh, we're going to make, we want to go towards this, which is an intent with these outcomes. Here's generally the process we're going to go through. I'm going to pause there. Is there any so, uh, questions or comments? Have you outlined the, the, the vision going forward for all the products? Or is this just... A specific product. I mean, this sounds like, um, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, this sounds like business process to me. Yeah. This doesn't sound like, uh, I mean. So what we're trying is to. Is that what your intent is? Sorry. I couldn't oh, help my. It, it feels to me like you're, you're hoping to simplify the networking cycle, right? The process of how things are done and sort of intermingle it with the business process, which it doesn't typically do well. Is yes, that? that's exactly right. Okay. So we're trying to create hey, right tools <laughs> that it facilitate that. Right. But it's going to apply to rock star hero <laughs> products. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and this is a research and development topic, yeah. guys. Right. Yeah, so right. Exactly. early, you guys are. This is early, 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 early. Right. I just wanted to be clear that that's what we were looking. At least for me, that I, that's what I was seeing. Yes, that's what you're seeing. Because it makes sense, unless it's only one specific product or one product line, right? But we're, this is, we're mostly focused right now in, in this concept in, from a research and development perspective around the DNA Center, okay. right? So that is the tool we're really primarily sort of thinking about this for. Okay. Um, so. Cool. And then down the road, after time, revisiting those things and saying, look, business 
uh, landscape has changed, user needs have changed, something's changed. Right. So what do we want to go back through this cycle right here specifically about taking a look at metrics and goals, maybe evolving those, going back and reviewing planning, simulation again, and executing the optimization. So, there was lots of discussion on the gamification, but not on this. I thought this would be a lot more interesting. <laughs> any, any other observations or comments on this before we go forward? I mean, we want to yeah, figure out what we want to do. We yep. want to figure out how to do it. We yep. want to do it. And then we want to review what we did. Yep. Uh, yeah, OK. OK. Yeah. Cool. And, and gamification creates engagement. There you go. There you go. <laughs> then we want to use how the tools are actually being consumed to help an organization understand what insights can they get, right? So you did these things over this period of time across these different intents. Here's what you can learn from that, right? Independent of us, right? So having the organization and almost audit the use of the tools, here's what you did. Here's what you learned and the metrics, and maybe there's something organizationally you can do to optimize, save money, right? So what this, what this appears to me to be is, these are the things that we should all be doing manually now, but almost nobody does, right? This is right? continuous delivery. Right, and so if you, realizing the fact that most people don't take good metrics on their network, they don't have good analytics, they don't necessarily do forecasting, capacity planning, if you can, but everybody knows they need to do it, just nobody does it because you don't have time for whatever reason or it's boring or whatever. So if you take that fact, I'm going to say it's a fact, and you say, now you don't have to do this stuff anymore, it just happens, right? Then it solves the problem of the thing that no one ever does. Am I, that's exactly, am I on the right path? Here? Yeah, that's, okay. that, that's a fantastic interpretation because, yes, uh, R&D is my jam. That's our intent. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, so if there's no more comments here, I'll pause and then now go forward. So a little bit more uh, nuts and bolts. I'm getting to the, the UIs here. Uh, but just telling you how we're sort of breaking this down. It really starts with um, a couple of things. Uh, we're looking across our systems, the tools, all the things that could be considered an object, right? So essentially, the tools are managing a whole series of things, right? Um, be they physical objects, be they things within those physical objects, be they virtual objects, right? We're trying to isolate those objects so we understand the relationship between those objects. Uh, incidentally, we're trying to create clear API paradigms so our tools are more open. Uh, we're trying to map those objects to workflows take those workflows to intents, because we know that there's certain workflows that might map against a bunch of different intents. So the tools become less like I have to navigate, this is just a tactical user experience thing, I have to navigate to a specific place to find something that I can use, say, search to find an object and execute a workflow <coughs> against that, right? Might be able to do other things like have a clearer understanding between the relationship of objects and the workflows that touch them, right? So if you think about a rules-based access paradigm in a team, what do I give access to? Who has access to what kinds of objects? It can execute what kinds of workflows, right? So maybe you can create clearer boundaries between team members or groups or organizations. An example of, uh, of the intents, uh, you know, business expansion or cost control, operations, speed, stability, et cetera. Uh, those are the kinds of things we're talking about. So the, again, the example I'm gonna walk through in a minute here is around software image management and uh, gaining efficiencies there. Okay, so everybody ready for the screen level walkthrough? Yes. Yeah, I think I just need to qualify something. We're focused here on the SD access portfolio and the user experience of the SD access software, or are you talking more generally about Cisco shift to intent? And so we're into the graphical interface of using the software that Cisco is bringing out around intent based networking. The latter. Right. right. Yeah. Oops. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. 
Okay, everybody see that? We're all good? Could you make it a little bigger? Um, I hate Don't. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. How's that? Is that a little better? Thank you. Okay. All right. Uh, okay. So this is just a conceptual, uh, everything you're seeing is conceptual, right? Because uh, it's in research and development stage. So uh, this is just a, a concept for what uh, the DNA Center homepage might look like. I'm going to focus your intent, uh, your focus here around intents. So you see some example intents. You see, you know, bring up branch offices in Paris. To the whole gamification thing that we were talking about around progress, this is how that's made, <coughs> right? So you've got this number of steps to go. You're step here, mm -hmm. right? So again, not a game, but taking the, the good things from that industry and applying it here for a sense of progression, right? Automate device provisioning. This many steps, you're here in that, that process, whether it be you as an individual or you as a work group. The one I'm going to dig deeper on is achieve software security and stability, software image management. Okay. So I see, is this, if I'm a Jira company, is this going to replace that? I don't even know if that's a good question, but I, I, what I see what you're doing could, you know, if I'm using Jira, some sort of project management tooling, mm -hmm. whatever it may be, is the intent to replace that? Or augment it? I augment it. Okay. Um, and let me give you a very specific example. Um, ITSM, yep. service, service management, yep. right? So if you're going to manage a change in the network and you track, you use ITSM to track that, like initiate and then track and update those tickets all the way to closure, that's a great touch point right. that we would okay. look to do. Okay. Uh, so remember back to the model I showed? The one that people weren't that interested in, but um, it was, you know, the first step was assessment, right? Understand pre-check, like, you know, what's my readiness? What do I need to know about this problem space? So if I look to unify my software image, get some efficiencies there, right? Uh, what do I need to know? So the first step here is the, the system is responded by saying, you know what, across your devices, you've got 143 different software versions in use. You've got 43 with severity one to three bugs. You've got another 21 with critical high security advisories. And six are past the maintenance uh, and you know, end of life type uh, supportability. We believe your sweet spot is on this 12, right? We think that's where you should prioritize your time, solving these 12. So let's start there. So we basically say, okay, if you're if you've got these 12, with, uh, which include two of unsafe criteria, we're going to move you towards five versions across that device stack <coughs> that will create uh, more uniformity. And, uh, and your, your compliance, uh, in this model, we've allowed you to set some criteria for compliance elsewhere. So we're, we're basically saying you're, you're going to get more compliant with your stated organizational goals. Any comments before the, I move on? The, I'm sure you're going to show it, but the resolve top priority issues, mm -hmm. is that going to automate all of my changes that I'm, that I'm being recommended to make? We'll get there. Okay. okay. Look, look at the button that the cursor's holding over. Resolve top priority issues. That he's getting ready to click. I, I'm hoping yeah. so. I, think I, I know this is mock-up, but is there right. any, can you tell us a little bit about how the system came to the conclusion about what the top priority issues are? Is that based, like, is some kind of balance between criticality and value of the system and, and other yeah, elements? Yeah, and we, we would like that to be organizational defined, okay. right? So there's, there's a tricky balance for us there, right? We want to come to the table and apply our expertise and say, based on our viewpoint across the industry, across our customers, here's our recommendations. But we also want organizations to be able to give input on that, right? Because you know, your, every organization is unique. They have their own criteria. They have what matters to them. So the goal is to straddle that line, right? So gain efficiencies through big data to say, OK, here's what we recommend, and then give our organizations the ability to tweak. So that's what's driving that. See, for me, this is really interesting, because one of yeah. the biggest challenges in existing networks is nobody upgrades the switches, right. because nobody sees them. So if now you just sit there and point the CIO at this and say, we need to allocate a project or resources to make this happen, then I can actually see this number decrease over time. 
So perhaps the way to look at this isn't gamification for the engineer, it's gamification for the executives who are all idiots, right? <laughs> they can't count to 10 on two fingers unless they've got a spreadsheet involved in a chart and a pivot table associated with it. So in the sense that, um, yes, Cisco ships a lot of code with bugs, this gives me a way of iterating forward to finding code without bugs, then there's something there. Right. This, I, remember what I was talking about, our design principles around building confidence by winning trust, right? So this is step one of that, right? Uh, you talked about like the, the amount of effort that people have to go through to manually, or sometimes they just they don't have time, right? They're busy people. This gives them an automated way to basically get to that snapshot really quickly. So if it's sharing up with executives that matters or within the team that matters, either way, there's better insight. Yeah, I think also technical people need some a new mission <laughs> To, to fire something at the management level to say, okay, we need to act here. But there's intrinsic benefits to us to doing that, right? Well, that's, you're going to get asked to do that, right? right? It's, regardless of what you think you need to be doing, you're going to get asked to do that. Mm. The easier you can make that, the better. The risk that I would see is the CIO is going to push that button. <laughs> <laughs> In all seriousness, right? Yeah. Make sure they can't do that. Okay. Unless, unless it's so slick that when they push the button, it it, it, it it protects them and it does such a good job that they they can push the button. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then the CIO is upgrading the switches. So remember yeah. I talked about simulation, right? Yeah. right? So, uh, and we'll, I'll show you the screens after this, but uh, the goal here is to not be so blatant that it's one click and then, you know, right. like, right? Like, I hope this works out. We wanna make sure that the progression, that natural progression that I talked about is evident. Right, so you build that confidence, like you know, pre-checks or simulation, whatever it's going to be, that we go through those steps. So if the CIO did press that button, there's some checks and balances before it actually executes. That was what I was trying to suss <laughs> out. So you know, are you going to go through like how that actually? Yeah, I'm, I'm, okay. I'm going. Out. I just wanted to make I, I, sure that every screen we have some cool. dialogue. I think every one of us has done a, a router upgrade or a switch upgrade where we that anxiety has that you just described. I mean, that's a familiar feeling to everyone in this room, probably. Yeah, you expect and, it to fail. Yeah. And, and I think also, sometimes you just grab with a script all the software versions and present it. The, but it helps also if you have something where you can say, Cisco recommends to do these yeah. steps now. Well, let's yeah? see the rest of the demo and then we can. Yeah. Yes, that's where we're going. Yeah. Okay, uh, so that very first screen I showed you, right, had you had, I can't remember, was it 143, 153 software versions across the device stack, right? So now we're breaking it down into the most important across by device type. So we're saying, okay, you know, here's your story with routers, switches, and wireless LAN controllers. So uh, what you really should be concerned about here, again, look, just look at the filter criteria. It might be hard for you guys to see. I apologize. I'll read it out to you in case you can't read it. Uh, it says the, the filter of what we're seeing here is coming from that pared down view. So you're looking at the devices that are, have software that has a sec, uh, critical security advisory, a bug sev one to three, and it's past the end of life. So for, let's say for this ASR 1000, actually was, let's look at the Catalyst 3850. So here's the problems, the issues we can solve here, that you can solve. Right, so you can you can go from uh, you got three software versions across these devices with this many security advisors, bugs, etc. This is the recommended version. We're actually giving you the version number of the software we recommend. <coughs> Again, to your question about uh, what's the criteria, so what we've seen across the industry, what we know, you know, TAC data, etc., and so forth, but also what other customers have done, and the criteria you've set. And then the call to action is set that golden image. Any questions about this before I go through yes. that? Yes. So you've got the recommended version right there. Is there a way that I can look at, I like to read release notes. Mm -hmm. Is there a way that that's easily accessible from there? Do I still have to go? I think that's dig? actually in, the, in this screen here. Okay. Um, oh, yeah, I see it. Yeah. So, uh, so I don't have to go digging through the TAC website. Can you, right. Yeah, I think, well, just a very subtle feedback, but your font layouts are all wrong. <laughs> in my view, I can't read any of that. Everything should be 16 point or bigger. None of this um, fancy schmancy 10 point. Uh, I like the font choices, by the way. I just don't like the font sizing. Everything needs to be bigger and readable. And there should be a lot less white space. Should be much more data on the screen. 
almost no white space. It should be packed full of dense information and much bigger fonting because uh, what, a lot of IT people actually can't read screens. And, and they're also projected on big boards in conference rooms or in you know, other situations. So your feedback's really valuable yeah. there. Um, keep in mind, I'm on a HDMI yes, no, here. I'm, it's I'm, really I'm, whacking yes. my resolution. No, I, I am. I'm yeah. taking that into account. But one of the things, that, like down in the bottom right-hand corner here, that's unreadable for most oh, people. This here? That's visually yep. unreadable for anybody who's got uh, any sort of eyesight degradation over time, which is most computer people. Yeah. Um, if because we spend a lot of time. So it needs to be like minimum 14 point a lot of time as a standard it. part of the design guide. <laughs> yeah, and, we are. <coughs> and you actually emphasize the wrong thing. So you see up there where you say image name, image 551, in that's what, a 24 point font, 26? That's not that's relevant. That's 26, data. probably. Relevant yeah. Data. Yeah. Yeah. How are you making these recommendations? And um, is it like vulnerabilities? Is it code quality that you were talking about earlier? Yeah, there's a bunch of variables that go in. This is where we work with our engineering colleagues uh, and product management colleagues to define that criteria. So those are the primary ones, right? So we're looking across that particular device, you know, and the, the, what we would define as the most uh, appropriate software, things like you just described, or, and whatever organizational criteria that may be added there. And that's really interesting, I think, because, I mean, just zooming out a little bit, right, just recommended intents in general seems to be basically embedding best practices into this system. Yes. Um, and, and so if I disagree with Cisco's best practices for whatever reason, right, I've got some kind of organizational reason to, to do things differently, is there a way to tweak what would be recommended as intents? Um, is that something that, you know, can, can I control that? This is generally on the specific use case. So I clicked on something that said set image criteria. So I can actually say, like, these are the levels, I, I believe what you're seeing here is the levels that are preset, either by us or a combination of us and by, with your input. But a user can change that, right? They can say, you know what? I'm not happy with this criteria. This particular device is critical, mission critical in a nuclear situation or in a hospital or whatever. And this criteria doesn't work for us. So you can change that criteria. Perfect. Yes? Is there a way to... Um, allow for some kind of operator or engineer feedback when, for some valid reason, you can't follow the recommendations. Like, we've seen vulnerability management tools that say, oh my god, everything's on fire in these five things and you have to do it. And you know you have to do it, but you can't for X, Y reasons because it's production, whatever the situation is. And so, is there any mechanism in the system so that if a, an executive is looking at this going, why hasn't this happened, that there can be some kind of feedback from the engineers to say, we know what's going on, and I'm trying to think if there's something in this demo <clears throat> that does that. Um, we're very aware of the need for that. I, I just I don't have confidence that I have something here to, to address that, but we're aware of that. Okay, is kind of the answer. Yeah. Any other comments here before we? Yeah, I like the image safety criteria of, of specifically that it's things affecting features in use. Um, as a thought, more generally. It, it would be very nice if we could take it to that next step, which is behavior changes involving fun features in use. <laughs> because that, that's the stuff that kills you when you upgrade, is when you, know, you discover that eh, an extra thing was added on the end of a command that you didn't know about, and the default behavior just changed. Mm. So uh, that would be the most useful. Because your point about, mm -hmm. I think, Phil, you're asking about the release notes. The point about that, one of the reasons we read them is not just to see what bugs are fixed, it's to see what behavior has changed. And we yeah. have to read, in theory, every release between the one we're on and the one we're going to to catch up on all the interim changes that happened. Right. So, so it's a whole day affair. So I'm excited. Yeah, right. <laughs> I'm excited because uh, we, the, the question over here was around criteria, right? So what you described is criteria. Oh, on those devices, I have these features enabled. Mm -hmm. Don't give me software that's going to mess with those features in use, right? So that's or, part of our... show me how the software is going to mess with those features in use. I mean, okay. maybe I want to go there, but I need mm -hmm. to know. Right? Yeah. You need to yeah. know that you may need to make a config change at the same time. Well, the only reason we need to know is because we don't trust our existing products and our existing software to do it right. That's right. Now, perhaps we're moving forward to an era where behind the intent-based model, Cisco, we're going to see a change in approach from Cisco to producing reliable, trustworthy software in which case, which would be driven by this model, right? Because if you go into this situation where you're going to click the software button, they can't take the risks with features and code like they do today. Yeah. So 
I think, you know, I do actually... Shouldn't. Should, I, I just want to, what I'm trying to do is reset your expectation. My general belief is that Cisco's moving away from the bad practices of the past of producing substandard code and iterating fast and make it difficult to own a network. I think they've realized that that is wrong. And this is a step in a direction to a much more stable, you know, if you're going to click a button on here and it's going to go and upgrade the network, it has to upgrade clean. That right. drives and, positive behavior. And part of the challenges with that is that, as with most vendors, software upgrade is considered a completely different process to configuration upgrade, right? It's not, the software upgrade is not, mm. I'll stage the code, I will stage an updated version of the config that will now work the same way under that new revision of code, and now I'll reboot into it or whatever it is. Oh. It's, here's your upgrade, you, you, you reboot, you load the code, and it either works or it doesn't, mm. and you'll find out. <laughs> but I do right. keep in mind too that in the SD Access environment, this is the DNA center for SD Access, we're also talking about moving the features into the overlay. So a number of the configuration challenges that we've had historically in the physical underlay get, become moot when the overlay, when all we, everything is done in the overlay. So if we make uh, the risk to operational status in overlay environments that we've seen, you know, in NSX, in ACI, uh, in EVPN, are far less um, than you see, it, it, you know, when you futz with OSPF or BGP in times going by. So maybe right. there's a transition there as well. Yeah, environment makes a big difference. Like where the, the, the tier of the device, as you say, whether it's you know, core access mm. versus core router mm. on edge of. If you blow up the EVPN config, you don't normally take the entire network out. Right. Where, whereas if we fits with OSPF, we might take the entire, the blast radius. Sorry. Oh, no. Um, I'm getting the five minute warning, so mm. just so you know. Um, talking about intent and the system being able to make recommendations. Mm -hmm. Is there a mechanism to sort of have a, a tier of recommendations? Like, I need outcome X. Yep. I can get to it directly by doing, you know, this. But for some reason, I can't. Then, okay, here's uh, option Y. Like an alternative path. Like a security thing. Like, I, you, the best thing to do would be to upgrade the software, but I can't for X reason. So maybe, you know, here's some firewall rules that will help mitigate this vulnerability, or will redirect traffic through this IPS for whatever reason. No, we haven't thought about that. So thank you for raising that. Um, our thinking at this stage is more along the lines of what these gentlemen were discussing uh, and, and creating a, a better sense of what it is, the motions that I got to go through to get there, yep. right? Yep. But not, not necessarily like accounting for modeling variant scenarios, yep. so. I was, I was thinking the same thing. In, intent, <laughs> right? I want to do this thing. Right. And maybe now, this. Now show me three ways I could do it, yeah. Oh, 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 oh you know, we, we have talked about uh, uh, something uh, loosely called the conversational UI, yeah. right? Where, okay, you, you know, like a scenario is you, you wanna buy a car, you walk into the showroom, right. right? And the salesperson says to you, obviously you wanna buy a car, you're here to buy a car. Do you have a family? Do you take trips? Do you go up to the snow? What, you know, what's the variables that are driving your decision to buy a, a vehicle, right? So I, I think that's kind of where you guys are going or that's the thing that we're trying to say is, okay, you wanna, and I didn't model that here, but here's your intent. Let's capture uh, some initial criteria on that, right. so that we can, you know, basically structure the downstream based on that input. I was thinking more like, I want to buy a car. I can come in and do it with cash, or I can set up a financing program, or we can work out some lease deal, whatever. Just give different options to get the same outcome. Yep. 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 I don't know if this is something you'll get to early on this, but I mean, you have all the recommendations for what should be applied and what should be upgraded. Is there any kind of sanity check or? Uh, health check that's run after these upgrades are run that will say, that will ensure that the device is running the same, that every, that the protocols are up, that everything looks the same, and what are those things if, if they're not, and how to correct them? Yes, okay. is the short answer, because I'm getting the time. Okay. Um, but that's, remember that model that I talked about around the performance against KPIs? That's that, okay. So, do you guys want me to, yeah? Can I ask one okay. more quick question? Yeah. Very quick. So you've got this model where it can, you know, see if the what's going to change and if the services are continuing or whatever. Is there a in the case of a failure? Because um, we all know it'll happen sooner or later, right? It's just you know statistically impossible that it won't. Is it able to roll back mm -hmm. using something like I don't know tail? So rollback's very important. We understand and realize that. So we're. Again, this is early thinking, right? So we want to enable those scenarios, right? So from simulation or pre-checks mm -hmm. to rollback, if there is a problem, that's part of the, the thinking. Okay. Yeah. Thanks.